It feels rather surreal now. I can't even begin to describe the intense flow of positive and extraordinary emotions we experienced on that momentous day, Sunday, June 5, 2022. Yeah, it was an amazing, amazing journey. Let me pause for a moment. You can see our faces. Imagine with me our experience. Feel our joy. That's Rob, Russ, Tofung, Glenn, Michael, Torben, Brett, and well, that's me. We arrived in St. Louis, Missouri, and it felt so satisfying. A dream had come true. You may wonder why we felt this way. The answer is simple and yet profound. Bikes, friendship, mission, long, sunny, and sometimes rainy days, full of magnificent views. In all honesty, the 1,200 mile trip was gruelling at times, but it was also perpetually exhilarating. And the best part? We had met so many people who were hungry to hear and learn about Jesus along the way. Many of those encounters touched me, changed me, and fascinated the whole group. I believe this is why June 5 has become indelible in my memory. Forgive me, I got carried away. You're missing some background. Let me start from the beginning. Oh, and by the way, my name is Anthony Kent. I'm a pastor and I'm one of the Associate Ministerial Secretaries of the General Conference. I'm one of the eight bicycle riders that embarked on this exciting journey. Join me as I share with you the story of our once in a lifetime trip. Our I Will Go bike ride started bright and early on Sunday, May 22. We departed from the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church in Washington, DC. That church, it's so loving, accepting and affirming. They organized a wonderful devotional for us. They prayed for us. And they also shared with us a delicious, nutritious breakfast loaded with all the carbs we needed for a ride like this. Now to understand where this story began, we need to travel back in time, specifically to the 1890s. And this is where it all started. A Scottish pioneer literature evangelist, Philip Rieke, started a journey of his own. He was widowed and divorced, and Philip Rieke longed for hope and searched for a new life in Australia. One day he was given a book called Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, and he discovered wonderful biblical truths that changed his life and compelled him to share his new Adventist faith with others. Immediately, Rieke left his work as an engraver and jumped on a bicycle. He rode thousands of miles around Australia, often on remote roads, seeking to engrave the love of God and His Word on people's hearts. Riki's commitment to evangelism allowed him to reach thousands of lives, including the life of my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Robert Kent. Tom was broken after his wife's passing. She was just 45. She'd been the mother of 11 children. And now Tom Kent, my forefather, struggled to determine how he would fulfill Mary, his wife's final wish. After contracting pneumonia and knowing that her end was nigh, she said to Tom, promise me one day we'll meet together in heaven and that you'll do all that you can so that the children will join us. Devastated by his wife's demise and perplexed by the promise he didn't know how to keep, Tom was ploughing in his field behind his horse when his hard work was interrupted by Philip Rieke. Philip shared with him a copy of The Great Controversy by Adventist Church co-founder Ellen G. White. Then Tom obtained the hope he desperately longed for leading him to share his discoveries with his children and neighbours. 
This act resulted in the formation of an Adventist church in Ugara, which is in the middle of nowhere in New South Wales, Australia. Since then, many individuals have given their lives to Jesus and been baptised into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Together, more than 20,000 people have discovered the life-saving love of Jesus, not only in Australia, but many other places, all because of this one man on a bicycle. Philip and Tom's stories kept surfacing in my thoughts during those trying times of the COVID-19 pandemic when our whole world was isolating, when social distancing was the norm and loneliness the usual, I started craving an opportunity to share Jesus and hope with people who were suffering. One day I called my friend, Dr. Torben Berglund, and we wondered what we could do for others and to also help ourselves physically and mentally. You know, as a Seventh-day Adventist minister, rather than believe in coincidence, I believe more in divine providence. I think that the Holy Spirit inspired us back in that conversation in 2021. The same Holy Spirit that led Philip Rieke and Tom Kent to share the gospel in the 1890s inspired Torben and I to start organising this I Will Go Bike Ride. So I picked up the phone and started calling, texting and emailing friends and family. We knew from the start, careful and thorough preparation was essential. We asked individuals, prayer groups and prayer teams to pray for us. Thousands of people were praying for us. We also needed to prepare physically. And for some of us, some middle-aged spread needed to be shed. Eventually, our group of eight international riders came together. Everyone chose to take personal vacation time to participate in the ride. Sponsors and organisation helped us with some of the costs, particularly the literature that we'd be sharing. But still, we were determined to provide personally for our lodging, food, bikes and our equipment. We didn't want this to be seen as tithe-funded tourism. Now before we continue, allow me to introduce you properly to our team of eight fantastic adventurous Peddlers. Our small group journeyed from DC through Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and finally into Missouri. 1,200 miles of mostly pure joy. We share a passion for pedals, frames, spinning wheels, and fresh air as well as breathtaking views. But our greatest thrill and joy on this ride was experiencing God's divine appointments that he arranged for us. You know, every time we share Jesus and are used by the Spirit to place truth and hope in the heart of a seeker, we experience extraordinary joy. Sorry, I didn't mean to be preachy, but we'll talk about witnessing some more. You know, it really was the best part of our whole trip. In those initial few hours, very early that Sunday morning, 
We were amazed how many people were out, strolling, exercising, walking their dogs, or just sightseeing. And they were so happy to chat with us, to hear our story and accept our literature. Our next stop was the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Building, the actual headquarters of the World Church. Our president, Elder Wilson, greeted us, prayed for us, encouraged us, and requested God's protection for our journey. Because the Lord will be gracious to you. So let me pray for you. I must say we felt so affirmed and special. Coming directly from the throne room of heaven. Thank you for hearing us. Bless every writer and the support team. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So many of our friends and colleagues came to greet us and to warmly send us on our way on that Sunday morning. I'll ask my friends to tell you more about themselves. My name is Russ Wilcox and I currently work for the South Pacific Division in their technology space as a Senior Ministry Systems Specialist. Uh, basically what that means is I'm there to, to be part of a team that oversees uh, technologies that help discipleship and the local church ministry. My wife's name is Christia and together we have three boys, Colin, Peyton and Luca. All three boys are in their teenage years, Colin is 19, Peyton is 16 and Luca is 14. It's a lot of fun being a father of three teenage boys, they keep me honest. I don't get away with much and they are now getting to the space where they know far more than dad on most things. Uh, so it's nice to be able to go to them for help on a whole lot of things. Cycling for me goes way back, I guess. Um, a number of years ago, I got into triathlon in my senior schooling years and I really enjoyed that. And then I took this big break while we had our family and my kids were young. Um, coming out of that, I started to get back into cycling. Um, I had some issues with health and in those valleys of, of poor health, uh, for example, I had a bad infection in my back, which was unexplained, um, a golden staph infection, which rendered me un un unable to walk. Uh, it was during that season I said, Lord, if I get out of this and I can still walk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a triathlon. And I set my sights on an Ironman. Yeah, we need to urine test Russ. <laughs> He's a very strong cyclist. I've, um, both Russ and I do triathlon and I've seen his times in the past and he's very impressive. But don't tell him I said that because we don't need his head any bigger than what it is. So I worked my way into that and uh, managed to do two of those. But then I had some injuries with mountain bikes uh, in one case and, and a road bike in another. And I was not sure actually if my wife would let me come on this ride, given the way I've had trouble staying on the bike, rubber side down, so to speak. Um, but sure enough, she let me come. Well, I, I was born in Norway, uh, but shortly after my, I was born, my father decided that and felt the calling to be a pastor. Uh, so we moved to England uh, when I was one and a half years old uh, and we lived there for five years but while he was studying uh, theology uh, and I, my brother was born uh, and then we moved back to Norway and my sister uh, also was, was born. So I grew up like in a pastor's family very very much uh, and that uh, like was very much like the framework of of our family. Uh, my dad and my mom were very, like committed to to ministry. Uh, so many of my childhood memories are related to ministry. Um, my father was uh, like the traditional type of evangelist, big public meetings. Um, and uh, I was involved in doing the slides. That was not PowerPoint slides, that was a good old slides and I would manage, the, manage them. So that's from very early on I was involved. That. So in that sense I grew up in the church. Um, I also 
like through my childhood, like from six years old, I sat every winter through this public evangelism uh, uh, series. Um, and for me, that of course impacted also my, my thinking. I got my first bike when I was four years old. Uh, that was like a small yellow BMX bicycle. Uh, and I think pretty much like my passion for I, I remember that bike and every bike I've basically I've had had since. Uh, so it was, it was a big passion. It's been a big passion even so much that when I, my last year of medical school, like before I started medical school, I had the idea that I would like to do some kind of bike business, bike shop or something. Uh, and then I started medical school and that sort of went dormant, uh, that uh, passion and idea. But then my last year of medical school, uh, then this dream came alive again. Uh, and I actually started uh, like a bike business uh, after medical school. So my last, I say my last year of medical school was 50% medical studies, 50% bicycle studies. Um, but I still, I still, I still passed and got 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 decent grades. So I, I'm still like as safe as a doctor, I think. Oh, that was funny. We woke up to a cold day in the low 50s. That's 11 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I just wanted to share a reflection from from the Psalms, uh, and as we consider what we're about to embark on this morning, uh, we're heading for the mountains. Uh, and not having been there before, I'm not entirely sure what to expect, but they're gonna be some big, some big ones, apparently. So that's exciting. Um, so I was thinking about a psalm, which is a song of ascent. And this was a song that uh, God's people would sing as they went up the mountain, so to speak, to Mount Zion, to, uh, to the temple. And, um, and they, would, they would have this song uh, among with, uh, I think it's about 15, or so psalms, which were songs of ascent, this was one that they have on their heart. Those who trust in the Lord, it's Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. If you think security and you think a mountain, you know, we, talk, we were just talking about security in guns, you know, but uh, a mountain, steadfast, secure, enduring as it were forever and those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. You're right Brett. Tofung is sensing it may be too chilly for her. She's not used to a temperature this low. She comes from the tropics. We had our morning devotional, prayed and started rolling, hoping she would feel warmer. It's a struggle for Tofung. We all saw her dressed in many layers to keep warm. It was heartbreaking to see her suffer from those low temperatures. I'm ready for the long ride, but just it's too cold for me. Yeah, every time we stop and resume the ride, my, my face like too cold and then my finger got numbed because of the, the, the cold. So I think I, I, I don't want to continue. I need to keep my body warm because I still have a long ways to go to St. Louis. But don't get the wrong impression. Tofung is made from steel and Kevlar. She's a successful triathlon athlete that impressed us with her strength and determination. She's handling these big days really well. Um, I, you can see on the cold days she struggles from that, that Southeast Asia climate that she's used to, but on the hot days she loves it. She's, um, yeah, I think she'd even like it to be hotter, which would kill the rest of us. But yeah, she's doing extremely well. I think her biggest, her biggest battle has been the diet, um, not having the food that she's used to, but she's, um, she's doing well under the circumstances. During those long hours on the bike, we had time to think. That's the beauty of exercise and fresh air. It helps your brain function well and enables you to focus on things of eternal value. As I thought about the very well-known verses in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I was reminded that Jesus spoke these words even to those disciples who had doubts, according to verse 17. This comforted me. I've also had my share of doubts, who hasn't? All authority, with you always, these are compelling promises. I'm Glenn Townend and I am the president of the South Pacific Division at the moment. I've been a long-term pastor, 36 years, uh, pastor, departmental director, president of a local conference then, union and now, now division. And our division is really quite unique because uh, we have Melanesian, which is the bulk of our membership, um, Micronesia, which is the smallest part, and then Polynesia. Um, and then we also have Australian, New Zealanders, um, Maori, Aboriginal, but also more recent immigrants uh, like myself. And uh, so cultural diversity is absolutely huge. Um, but amazingly, we all get on. And I think that's the uh, blessing of God. Uh, look, uh, as long as I can remember as a, a child, I've had a, bi a tricycle and then a bicycle. Um, my dad grew up in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is a city of bicycles. And my mum used to ride her bike to, to school or to the bus to get to school. She lived in farms um, in, in Gympie. So they've always given us bikes. And um, biking has just been a part of our, my brother and my life. I do have a very stressful job, I understand that. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. Um, and cycling is a part is an important part of that because I keep physically healthy um, and to be able to do what I do, physical health is a real blessing. And then also keep mentally healthy uh, because all the stress and worries can go as the endorphins come into the body, you feel the breeze coming, you, it's, you know, breathing in the fresh air, you're out in the countryside, uh, enjoying God's creation and, and you're able to spiritually refresh and, and, and pray as well. So for me, it's one of those disciplines that I enjoy that keep me fresh and focused. As I ride, I, I try and just think about the ride, um, nature around God, but it's amazing. I try and put the, all the, the problems and challenges behind me. But as you ride and you just let your mind wander and, and, and pray, ideas come. And then at the end of the ride, other times go, oh, that's the, the solution to the problem. And um, yeah, that's one of the, the, the benefits. Yeah, my name's Brett Townend. I'm the conference president for the South Queensland Conference. So we're based in, in Brisbane, Australia. Glenn's my older brother. Uh, and then I have a younger sister, Carolee. Um, and Glenn and I are only about 18 months apart. And so he's always driven me because I've always had to try and keep up with him, you know, being the older brother. Uh, and he's very driven, very competitive. Uh, and so it, it, it made me become pretty much the same because he had to keep up with my older brother, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and then of course, um, I do remember, um, well, it's, I don't, actually personally remember this but my, my mum tells the story about him riding his tricycle with a little trailer on the back and I was sitting in the trailer and we were in Adelaide and he said well mum said where are you going and she and he said well we're going to ride to Gympie which is where my grandparents lived that would be oh I don't know two and a half thousand kilometres away <laughs> so we didn't make that journey I think we'd be still on the road now if we'd started out <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, great memories as a kid. We, we lived in New Guinea for, uh, for five years. Uh, Mum and Dad were up there as missionaries and we had a great experience, a great time there, fond memories of that. Uh, and growing up in a, in a very nurturing spiritual environment was, was a, a big part of my childhood. 
I started riding bikes uh, as, a, as a little kid really and um, we used to ride bikes to school um, and that was, that was uh, you know, the way we got around as kids a lot on bicycles. And I've always been interested in, in them, but then um, I was playing basketball as, as uh, recreation with my son. And then when I moved, uh, when he moved out of house and we moved to a new district, um, I wasn't able to play anymore. And I was getting a bit old for that anyway. So I thought, well, I need to do something to, to exercise to keep fit. Uh, and so I went back to the bikes and, uh, and took it up a bit more seriously then and started cycling you know, on a regular basis and, uh, and one thing led to another. Yeah, so that's how it all started for me. You know, some of the best uh, sermon, uh, sermons that I develop are while I'm riding my bicycle. As we were rolling along, we found Ralph, a Christian from Hedgesville, West Virginia, who needed prayer and comfort that day. Glenn and Russ had a heartwarming visit with him. Ralph, could we have a brief prayer with you before we continue on? It would be great. Lord, thank you for this chance meeting. Uh, actually, probably not a chance meeting. You ordain all sorts of things for us each day. Mm. We're so pleased to meet Ralph. We pray that you'll bless him. May his walk with you deepen and grow. Mm. Thank you for his service in the Vietnam vets, Lord. And yeah. What he did for his country. And uh, thank you for this place, which he's named your house. May you bless it with your presence. May you bless him with health and strength and joy and good friends in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Nice to meet you. you. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Take care. Huh? Encounters like this started to appear more and more frequently in our journey. Mark chapter 16 says that striking signs will follow those who believe and do the work of missionaries. This is so encouraging and inspiring. Interestingly, Jesus wants us to do this and calls us to do it. He could have said to his disciples, don't worry about anything, don't do anything. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and the hosts of heaven are going to come down to preach the gospel to every nation of the world. And I think they'd do a much better job than any of us. But he didn't say that. He gave the great commission to his disciples and his followers down through the ages even to me. Because my grandfather died when I was a little girl, so my grandma was a very faithful church member. I can see my mom and my grandma, every morning they wake up, they pray, they study Bible, and they give a very good example for my life. And that's something I will never forget. Um, and give me, a, so that's what I, I follow them. Even when I grow up, I'm busy with life. I just remember that, uh, a good example for my grandma and my mom. Every morning, the first thing we do, we get up, study the Bible, and pray. When I finished uh, college in Vietnam, then there's an Australian elder. He's the publishing director of our union at that time. He came and he wanted to start a literary, a cold water training. So I, I'm in the training, and so, uh, after the training, he said that I need a leader, and he just pulled out me, you will be the leader. And so that's how my ministry started off. <laughs> but what I found out here when I come to America is that my, my other writer, the seven men, so strong. They're really strong out of my expectation, and it's really difficult for me to try to catch up with them every day, but I, I really try my best. I just want to let my, my husband and my boss who sent me here make them feel proud. So I, I try my best every day to be in the roof and ride with, with the other riders. A new day and a new test is on the horizon. We'll have to do some serious climbing today and our minds need to be focused on the challenge. Talking of challenges, I know Michael has been through some very challenging moments in his life. May his testimony help you to understand God's amazing grace a little better. Yeah, there were some challenges along the way. Um, probably that really began when I was about 16 months old. My mum 
Um, if it was the modern day, she would have been diagnosed with postpartum depression. Um, but she didn't, she didn't know what she was going through and she just couldn't cope. She was a young mum, my, my parents married young. And uh, so her only way out of the situation was to, to leave. And so um, she rang my dad one day at work and said, I can't do this anymore. You better come home, Michael's in the cot, I'm out of here. And, uh, and, and my dad being a young dad, he was 23 at the time, um, you know, he was kind of like, what do I do? <laughs> so he, he moved um, back in with his parents. And uh, for the next couple of years, in many respects, um, my grandmother raised me and I, you know, I, I have a very close relationship with her. And, and I have to say that as a child, I was happy and my life was all that I knew. So I wasn't discontented or, uh, or, or whatever, but I grew up in an agnostic home. You know, it wasn't that my home was anti-religion, but Christianity, Jesus was not part of our conversation. It really, really didn't bear any part uh, of my upbringing. So the day after my fifth birthday, my dad remarried. So my uncle Les, uh, just, just the most wonderful, gracious, self-effacing Christian man, he made a private commitment to God. He never told anyone about it, but he made a private commitment to God that he would pray for me every day. And uh, I didn't see him for another 10 years, more than 10 years, but he kept praying for me. And uh, he probably never knew when he was gonna see me again. He didn't know how it was gonna work out, but the power of intercessory prayer. And, and if there's anything I want to communicate is the power of praying for people, and praying for loved ones. And you, you never know when a seed is gonna germinate. So anyway, my dad remarried and uh, things went along well. Um, my, my stepmother was, was and is, um, you know, a, a wonderful lady who's, who's always looked out for my interests. And um, when, when I was 12, um, I guess we hit another, another speed bump, another, another change of direction in my life um, where, where my, my dad decided that, um, yeah, he, he came out and uh, he, he left and uh, yeah, moved in with, with his, his male friend and uh, yeah, it was very, it was a, a heavy time for me. And, um, and that's not to criticize my dad. I, I have a wonderful relationship with my dad. He, um, one thing I'd say about my dad is that he never once in my life has ever said a bad word to me about my birth mum, even though she left, even though that was such a traumatic thing. And I, I've always respected my dad so much. <laughs> for the grace in which he handled his own grief, no doubt. Um, so anyway, here, here I was, um, and my stepmother was, as I say, a, a wonderful lady, is a wonderful lady who, who continued to care for her adopted son um, when, when neither my birth mum was on the scene and my dad. Um, it was interesting, I, t I tell you one, um, short interesting story at one stage when i was in my early teenage le years i lived it was a very busy road with my stepmom in one house 12 doors down the road was my dad living with his partner and then immediately across the road from my dad was his parents my grandparents were living across the road so i would be able to go and visit between the three houses at will and so that that cre created some completeness in my life you know in that i wasn't disconnected from any of my immediate family. On my 14th birthday, I received a birthday card from my birth mother. Uh, that was my first interaction with her since I was 16 months old. But my dad had raised me knowing that I was adopted, knowing that I had a birth mother, and uh, they didn't know who the card came from because, you know, birthday cards come in the post, they're addressed to me, so I opened them. Um, but that was the beginning of her coming back into my life. And uh, she had come to faith herself. Um, she had become a Seventh-day Adventist. She'd sort of been raised with some Adventist background, but um, in her mid-30s, she came and made a, a life commitment to Jesus. And part of her making her life right was to reconnect with me. 
And uh, so she connected with me initially through a birthday card. And then I guess with some trepidation from my dad and my stepmother and from me, we, we sort of started communicating and, and built a connection until um, about 18 months later, I went to have a holiday with my birth mum um, back in Tasmania. It was meant to be a one month holiday, um, but I was 15, there was lots of turmoil going on in my life and you know, we don't have time to unpack it all. But uh, the upshot of it all was I decided to stay there with her. I saw her faith and uh, yeah, that, that kind of, I, I was asking some really deep questions about what is the point of life. Um, I was achieving success in my sporting endeavours and but it all just seemed empty, you know. For, so for me, I was sort of starting to ask questions and that was when I met Uncle Les again, 10 and a half years later. Uh, hadn't seen him, didn't even know who he was really. He knew who I was. <laughs> um, and it turned out that my, my mum and my dad's Uncle Les, they went to church together and so they knew each other and because of the previous marriage, they had a bond and a connection. So my Uncle Les would come around to our place for dinner. And that was how I sort of got to know him. And, and I remember very distinctly, it was at my 16th birthday that I was, again, pondering the point of life. I was undertaking activities that were heading me down the wrong pathway. Um, I was on the edge of dropping out of school and um, it was kind of a, a, a point of saying, yeah, what is going on? And there was some spiritual warfare going on in my life as well. And it was at that point that I decided to give my heart to Jesus. And the amazing thing about it was, it took a, it took a little while to kind of figure out the direction to get the equilibrium, but it was my uncle Les who gave me Bible studies. And it was my uncle Les that ran a revelation seminar in my house. It was my uncle Les who gave me one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. And it was my uncle Les who, I wish he'd been in the font as I think back on it, but he stood there beside the font uh, as the pastor baptized me uh, about six months later. Because once I'd made that commitment, I knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do um, is to follow Jesus. And yeah, it was a little bit bumpy at times. Um, but, but God gave me a sense of purpose. Um, it was almost like a fourth dimension came alive in my life. That how have I missed this fourth dimension in my life, this spiritual reality going on around me, yet I was ignorant to it. My experience is that Jesus is very real. And when God started putting people in my life to say, you should be a pastor, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It was the furthest thing from my mind, um, but, but somehow, through God giving certainty, through God giving purpose, through God giving a calling, God is not only able to give you assurance and peace and to help you come through whatever it is you're going through, but He can actually redirect you in a different pathway. Praise the Lord for His timing, never-ending grace, and indescribable affection for us all. The gravel roads started to complicate things for many of us. And as always, Don's professional and careful help made all the difference. I was experiencing an internal turmoil. I'd been so careful that we would only be on sealed roads. I was silently praying, God, why did you bring us on this rough and difficult road that was potentially dangerous? And then we started to meet the people who lived on this road. They were so accepting of us. Then it became clear, God had us on this road for a purpose. We're given the Great Commission to represent Jesus to the world. So when the world looks at us, hopefully they see what Jesus is like when we claim to be Christians. Do they see the long-suffering, love, and His holiness, meekness, mercy, and truth in me? Thank you.
If you're anything like me, you have sometimes reflected on the Great Commission and felt overwhelmed. How are we to go into all the world? There are so many people and so many voices in the world today. We live in divided societies. The responsibility that God has given us can be daunting. But we have a message of life, eternal life. And the only other option is death. The world needs to hear what we have to say. Because these are not our words and it's not our message. It's the message of Jesus. And he tells us to go to everyone on the face of the planet and tell them that I love them and I want them to be saved. Philip Rieke visited the farm of my great-great-grandfather, Tom Kent, Tom and Mary Kent. Um, and so that one book that he sold, Tom Kent, that uh, influenced the Kent family, um, well, that's my family. So my mother is a Kent. It's, it's special to be able to, to, you know, pay back what he did to our family. Um, my mum, you know, constantly messages me to say, you know, your, your grandfather would be very, very proud of what you're doing. Yeah, I'm the, of the eight, I'm the only one that's not employed by the church, of the eight cyclists. I feel like the odd one out, the black sheep of the group. Um, I have never been employed by the church. I'm a, a CFO of a, a retail furniture company, so this is very different to um, what I do every day of the week. Yeah, my family is, is everything to me. Um, I have a beautiful wife, Jane, who's just been so supportive of, of this trip. Um, I've got two adult sons, you know, in their 23, 24 year olds. Um, one of them is engaged, which has just thrilled us to bits. Um, beautiful girl that is, that is um, asked to marry him. Um, and, uh, you know, I think everything I do in life is around my family. And if being part of this strengthens their relationship with Jesus, then I've achieved everything I could ask for. Well said, Rob. The Lord began to show us that we need to be more confident in our witnessing. We shared many copies of The Great Controversy in Your Bible and You, and heartwarming conversations took place this Thursday, May 26. God was revealing to us that the limit to our witnessing was our capacity, not His. Today, it's a Friday. We'll move as fast as possible to make it to Parkersburg before sunset. But of course, we'll stop to meet people and pray with them. Hey, you're talking about us. You've got to finish all this and then you've got to start inside there. Yeah, I've got to come up along the inside. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a good job at making a difference. Oh, yeah. Looking good. So we just had a really nice visit with Trevor and his two boys, his teenage boys. Uh, we're actually preparing to head out on the camping trip and we rolled in there yeah, and, and oh, yeah, they were super too. friendly. Uh, Anthony shared with them and we told them the story of Philip Ricci. Anthony yeah. shared a book and and uh, they were really appreciative and it was, it was such a nice visit. Yeah, it, it was yeah. and like they were welcoming, they were accepting and, and really open and, and Russ led them with prayer and uh, yeah, like they were so respectful with the prayer and responsive. To me, this is what it's all about. Praying with people, meeting people, sharing the message. We left them with the great controversy and your Bible and you. And it's just really satisfying. So there's the flyer. There's the riders inside. Tells you who we are and five of us are from Australia. As you can tell, we're not from around here. Yeah, most people around here wouldn't ride through Missouri on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, I think you got that right. But it's truly beautiful riding through here. There's the book that uh, is told about in the story there. I'll leave that with you. It's a life-changing book. I hope it encourages you. Just got over 40 miles to go. A, a storm system is coming through with really severe storms. It's 40 miles to our hotel. Sabbath is coming in. So we've just got to pause our witnessing 
just so we can get to the hotel and be safe. We're disappointed about that, but it's just what we've got to do. Dear Father, thank you for an awesome day. Thank you for clearing the rain up this morning and thank you for keeping us safe as we've uh, motored along some beautiful scenery and seen some spectacular animals. We just ask that you'll be with us now in this last 20k as we head into Parkersburg. Keep us safe, help us to concentrate and uh, to get to our destination safely, ready for a hot shower and a big meal and a good sleep. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm okay. But I'm happy it's only 20 kilometers left. So, have a warm shower, rest day, Sabbath tomorrow would be wonderful. I've had the opportunity to travel extensively and discovered a constant. It's the bonds of love that's shared with my Adventist family around the world. We presented a program at the Parkersburg Church. We spent a lovely Sabbath with our fellow believers in this West Virginian town. One of the members of the church selected a song that we all sang together. And that song stayed with me for the rest of the ride. It's an old song that I hadn't heard for many years. In the preparation for the ride and during the ride, I was anxious about the safety of the whole group. We had taken every precaution so that we would be safe. But then we sing that hymn, Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. It certainly stayed with me, and it gave me such enduring peace. In my thoughts, I went back to Matthew 28, 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It doesn't matter. Jesus says to you and me, doubters, go and share the gospel with every nation on the face of the earth, going and giving, going and giving. In going and doing, we ourselves experience a transformation, our doubts fade and become beliefs. As a non-trained layman, you know, which is what we all are, is you know, we are the, the volume of the church, um, I would absolutely recommend stepping out of your comfort zone. It's been the most rewarding, what are we up to, 10 days or so of, of being able to share an incredible story and an incredible hope with people. Um, look for opportunity, my, my, I suppose my advice is look for opportunities in your everyday life that you really enjoy doing or that you just do as part of a habit and build on that. It happened repeatedly. We didn't engineer it, but we certainly prayed for it. This is a God thing. You'll see it happening every time you get involved in mission. Even though hard to describe, it's real. God orchestrates encounters, and we, in awe, see his grace in action, working through finite human hands and human voices. I can only invite you and encourage you to step out in faith and do something for someone in need of Jesus. Be ready to be surprised. It's going to change your life forever.
Oh yeah, we met some really nice ladies. Um, they they said there was nothing really going on here, uh, but it was great to chat with them. And uh, as we chatted, sure enough, we had lots to chat about, didn't we, Anthony? It's fantastic. It was a, there was one lady there. Her name was Leslie. First of all, she said she was a pagan, and in the end, she was praying with us, and she prayed, which was just fantastic. She accepted a book in the end as well. So, I'm just. Praising God for that. I've developed now an awareness that God is already ahead of us. He's preparing the hearts we're going to meet. And we've seen in a number of the stories and, and the valleys and the, the places we've been uh, that God has already ordained these connections. And so going with that sense of faith just gives me such confidence to say, God, I don't know what's coming, but I'm looking forward to it. And this is the confidence that we can have because it's not self-confidence, but confidence in what God will do and can do through us. Ministry is always a, a blessing. Uh, you think that you're giving uh, your time and your effort and, you know, books and, and a message, but when people respond, that blessing just comes back to you double fold and, and gives you energy and, and you kind of go, hey, yep, let's get back on our bike. Let's get back and, and see if we can meet some other people um, on, on this ride. So ministry is energizing. In Ohio, we had many remarkable encounters. This filled our hearts with much joy. I was also happy to see Tofung enjoying the warmer weather. We love Ohio. Today's sunny weather and the road is just rolling, no steep hill. I really enjoy so far. We're doing 100 and, what is it, just under 100 miles today? Yeah. yeah. Some days 125, some, some days 100. Oh Lord, we did. Probably about 60 miles yesterday, and I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, good to meet you guys, eh? Hey, you too. Yeah. Something you scan with your phone, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Oh, yeah, I see that. Yeah. And it, it'll actually read the book to you. Oh, it reads the book to you? Yeah. It's even easier. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't get easy as that. Well, that's right, in English or Spanish. I'm a well, I'm, all right, so yeah, so I can, I can learn Spanish at the same time. <laughs> Stay there for a second. Stay there. Just rest for a second. In any major pain. Okay. Okay, just feel your back first. Feels okay? And your hip doesn't feel broken at all. And lift your legs. Gently sit. And tell me if it's okay. I'll always remember Ohio. It all happened in a second. Just some loose gravel on the road, and it hurt. But nothing too serious happened, and I can laugh about it now. From now on, I was going to need an extra portion of God's help to reach a destination in St. Louis. You can see it through here. Oh, yeah. All the way through here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it was this book. And this book has transformed our family like you would not believe. I'm Anthony. This is my cousin. Hello. Rob. Rob. Yeah. You are. Good. Who are you guys from? Well, we're from Australia. He was from Australia, but lives here big now. I used to call it Maryland, but I can say Maryland now. Yeah, I, great, <laughs> great. How about Louisville? Is it Louisville or Louisville? Louisville? Great. Is that all right? Yes. It's hard with my Australian tongue. Even though we've been living here for 16 years, Lord, we just thank you that you've blessed us with this wonderful day. We thank you for the opportunity of meeting with Pam. Lord, we ask that you'll bless it. Bless her loved ones, her family, her friends, her business. As she cuts people's hair, Lord, guide the conversations. May they be 
conversations that lead to eternal life. So Lord, we just thank you that you're the great God, the God of love, goodness, the God of the future, the God of eternity, who gave your Son, Jesus Christ, for our, Lord, for our eternal life. And now, Lord, just shield and protect the rest of the world. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. We made the mistake of stopping at a convenience store and uh, we found some goodies. Otherwise, I think we were keen to push on and get another hour or two in while the, while the day is still clear. What do you think, Greg? Oh, I didn't think we ought to be going. But there are, I guess, nature's needs and we need to accommodate that. We do indeed. But we've got some good flat territory ahead and we know it's going to be a hot day, so... Kentucky. I Thank hope you. you enjoy your time here. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Brooksville, Kentucky. Remember that. We'll never Thank forget. You. Yeah. So I, I would, uh, I would call up to people, and I would just naturally, in my Australian way, I'd say, "G'day, how are you going?" Or well, that, that "G'day" expression. <laughs> so they're straight away like, "Oh, that's where are you from? <laughs> You're an Aussie." Yeah, that's right. I'm an, I'm an Australian. And they said, "Oh, you've got a funny accent," and I thought to myself, "Man, I, you think I've got a funny accent?" <laughs> <laughs> this fellow from Kentucky, he talked to me for about five minutes. I didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> I couldn't. I we're, we're riding from DC to um, St. Louis. Oh, really? Yeah. That's too bad. It is. Yeah. But well, it's, it's good exercise. Well, we're just going to pick up tracks on the side of the road. Make, oh. make sure it's not one of you. Thank you. Hey, we're, we're, we're pleased about that. Very pleased. Hey, um, we're doing this in honour of an Australian uh, cyclist. You can probably tell that you've got an accent. Yeah. yeah well, I got a New York accent. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you, you sound right. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that, that's good. So that's the information. You and we're donating for somebody. No, no, no. no, no. See, see, they're all of the riders, and most of us are from Australia. This is the handsome one right here. Oh, yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's what he thinks anyway. Well, you know, he's right. <laughs> God's gone ahead of us in, in so many examples. It's, it's been quite amazing. Uh, preparing preparing uh, meetings with people. We call them divine appointments and, and we've really noticed that being the case. You know, people who were actually, uh, you know, physically upset and crying as we shared there's one guy, uh, you know, I just wanted to reach out and give him a big hug. It was, it was very sad as we shared the story of uh, the Thomas Kent story about him losing his wife. And, and uh, this, this gentleman broke down and started crying. He said, I've just lost my wife, you know. And uh, yes, you know, we could have passed that guy by, but, but it was a divine appointment. We stopped, we spent the time with him. We had prayer with him and it was just a, a wonderful experience to know that God had orchestrated that in his own way for it to happen for us and for, for the, the gentleman that we spoke to. Yeah. And so this is what we're doing, riding around, sharing Christian books with and those yeah. So they're yours. And one cool thing about that book is if you look at the start of each chapter, can I just can I... Yeah. I, I, will, I will not read it. Oh, won't you? So I'm, I, so I'm not going to tell me rude and, and I just, I won't read it. So you have the book back. Okay. I, I appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be rude or anything. No, no, no. We're just, good. That's, that's not my thing. Okay. So. Would you would you listen to it? No. No. I'm sorry, no. And there's nothing that you, no offense. No, no, no. no we're not good. That's not my thing. Yeah. I appreciate it. I, I, appreciate, I, admire, your, I admire your guys' strength and your fitness and all that stuff and pre passing the word. This is. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And no offense taken. No, no, no. And I really appreciate you just taking the time to listen. To yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course, re rejection hurts, but you, you think that's their choice. They're not rejecting me. They're rejecting the gift of a book. And we can't even extrapolate that they're rejecting Christ. It is, it, it is best to smile, graciously accept their response, don't burn any bridges, because Christ can use another person, other people. 
I'm not the Messiah. There are other people that can reach these people with gifts, with a personality, with, with an approach that will target their needs and, and what needs that they're encountering. Jesus isn't finished with those people. He wants everyone saved. And that's why everyone in the church has a part. I will go needs to incorporate all people where all personalities, all gifts, all resources of the church are used to proclaim Christ. Don Friesland deserves special tribute. He cared for our bikes and he cared for us. He was our constant shield from the unpredictable aggressive drivers. He was generous with the treats and he always had a good joke for us to lift our spirits. A terrific friend, wow. Hey Don, I just want to thank you mate. Absolutely. Yeah. Here I'll let you. I could cry with thankfulness. Oh. You are an angel on our backs, just shielding and protecting us, thank you. Yeah. Day by day, hour by hour, He's been in his truck, shielding us from the back. He's been like a, an angel on our, on our wings, so to speak, to, to make sure that no harm and danger from the rear will happen to us. That's just been a real godsend. Well, the group is a great group of, uh, of riders. The, the uh, camaraderie is uh, probably some of the best that, uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, everybody's having a great time. Everybody's joking around with each other. If one person uh, falls back a little bit, it's not unusual to see two or three people drop back and pull that person back into the, uh, the group. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal group. It's, it's, it's meeting the people uh, and watching the interactions uh, is really something, uh, something special. You can see uh, different things that happening that makes this uh, uh, totally worth, uh, worthwhile. Uh, and I was actually quite surprised at that. I thought people would be a lot more uh, maybe resistant or hesitant to take this material. Uh, but um, in fact, it's been uh, just the opposite. There's not a whole lot of money in the bike business. Pretty much everything that I've been doing has all been, uh, been volunteer. In fact, any stipends that uh, we did get uh, over the last uh, 20 years has all gone to uh, charities. We put a whole bunch of bikes in Africa. We actually uh, built them a uh, bike shop sent that money over there. And there are three wives. There's my wife, Deborah, there's Pam Townend, and, and Ray Marie Townend. These three ladies have done so much for us. They've fetched and carried things, they've cooked, they've prepared nutritious meals for us, they've, they've done our laundry, they've supplied us with, with all that we need. And we, we couldn't do it without these unseen ladies. They probably won't appear on camera or very rarely, but wow, they have been the, the, the real strength for us to, to rely on and to support us. These 1,200 miles taught us a few lessons. The first one is that people are in need, in desperate need of human touch, a friendly face, for someone that would offer them prayer Secondly, God is always ahead of us, always preparing the way and organising our witnessing opportunities. Thirdly, it gets easier and better as you practise it more. Fourth, it doesn't have to be complicated. Use a hobby, whatever you enjoy doing, whatever is easy for you, and start finding commonalities with others. Start small and let it grow in God's mighty hands. Fifth, be prepared to see miracles happen and to be transformed. Yes, as you share, you'll find that the biggest blessings come back to you. That's what we found. And here we are again, right where we started, arriving safely in St. Louis. Although tired, we are amazingly energized. Even though this adventure is over, I'm confident this won't be the last time we embark on a journey like this. This is just a brief pause as we await God's continual daily leading. I hope that what you've witnessed has inspired you to think of exciting and exhilarating ways to share your faith 
with a world in desperate need. Join us as we say together, I will go. Thank you.